Hey everybody, thanks for tuning into my channel today. Um, uh, on my YouTube channel, I like to discuss all aspects of um, sexual exploitation, sexual health, prostitution, trafficking, pornography, and um, all that interesting and juicy stuff that no one wants to talk about that's affecting everybody around us all the time. Uh, so I'm here today with um, uh, my new friend Ellie, all the way from Germany, Ellie Arrow. And uh, Ellie, I'll just ask you to uh, introduce yourself to, to my listeners and um, let us know a little bit about, about who you are and what you do. Hi, everyone. I'm Ellie Arrow from Germany, um, and I'm a feminist activist and an educator on the sex trade. Um, many people might know that prostitution, so that's both running a brothel or an escort agency and buying sex and selling it, they're all legal here. And for a long time, our model was touted internationally as almost exemplary. Look at Germany, so forward thinking. It's part of human nature. Might as well make it legal and safer. And once I looked into it, I started looking into it when I was still a high schooler. Um, and now I've been doing this for, yes, going on seven, eight years. Um, I'm starting to feel old <laughs> and I'm only 26. <laughs> but um yeah, what, what you find of how it actually works out in practice is pretty disturbing. Um, the the amount of, of violence that just goes under the radar that even gets put under the label of sex work, um, the continued uh, lack of support for people in the trade, the vulnerability, um, these are all things that I started looking into. And uh, it's one of those subjects when you looked into the abyss that long, um, it doesn't let you go and you feel the need to, to go out there and tell people about it, even though, like you said, they, people don't want to hear it. But yeah, I think it's very important. I think it's an issue that affects everyone. I think that's very clear when it comes to porn, which very much intersects with prostitution. Like it's basically the same population. Women in prostitution are often made to also produce some kind of porn. And women in porn often end up having to also um, actually, you know, make so-called dates with Johns to make ends meet. Um, it's a point affects everyone. It's in everyone's homes, but there is a lot more prostitution out there than people think, including in people's homes, actually, because uh, one of the most common forms of brothels in Germany is the apartment brothel. So I live in a building with lots and lots of apartments. It's absolutely possible that one of those apartments is a brothel. Mm. And, uh, and so yeah, it's it's not as far away as people think. It's not just at the in the industrial area, the outskirts of the city, but it can be very close to home. Sure. And uh, just because it's legal doesn't mean it's fine. Um, and yeah, we'll get into those issues. Yeah. So yeah, I want, I want, the focus today is going to be on discussing the legal brothels in Germany. So you've been studying this for a few years now. You said, yeah. And I'm curious, when did when did brothels and prostitution become fully legalized in Germany? And, and let's talk a little bit about the different models around prostitution. So like, for example, in Canada, we have what's called the Nordic model. Up until 2015, there was no real laws about prostitution. It was legal. But what practically was happening is mostly only the women would be arrested for prostitution and the buyers, the Johns and the pimps, were usually had no repercussions. So they switched to the Nordic model a few years ago in Canada, where now they do not criminalize the women selling sex, but they uh, um, can charge uh, the people buying sex and they can charge the pimps. It's illegal to live off the proceeds or the avails of prostitution. So the, the thinking behind that is why should you punish the women that are being prostituted because many of them are being controlled by their pimps they're being coerced and manipulated through drugs alcohol threats to their children many of them have mental health issues and the vast majority of them have uh, trauma and sexual abuse in their background so why are we arresting them and giving them criminal records and putting them in jail and if we target the demand for paid sex and go after the johns and the pimps we can deal with the issue more effectively. So that's that's the state in Canada right now, although it's not really reinforced, sadly enough. But talk about what what's the what's the deal over in Germany, like where everything is legal. Would, would you say that it's it's decriminalized or is it fully legalized? Or what's the status? 
So this is actually quite complicated if you get into it. A uh, very short note on history. Um, it's Well, people often point to this law that Germany passed in 2002, the Prostitution Act. That's when it was made clear this is an industry and job and we'll treat it as such. And, you know, brothel owners are just business people. John's just clients and um, the women selling, they are workers. But this doesn't mean that we had total prohibition before. Actually, there's a very, very, very long history. If you want to, you can go back to Roman times. Oh. Um, but you, from Roman times throughout Middle Ages, um, you actually have legal brothels. Like that was a normal part of, of uh, many, many cultures. I, I, as a feminist, I call them patriarchal, mm -hmm. um, possibly imperial. I mean, very normal for soldiers, but really anyone from the emperor to, to the beggar on the street, there was a prostitution sector for them. And there still is today for basically any man in society. Um, there, there'll be a price range. So it's a very normal um, thing for men, certainly in Central Europe, not all over the world, interestingly. So there's there are some cultures that didn't practice this or not to the same extent, but it was very, very normal, um, you know, during, um, I always point to the example of the, the, um, the con sorry, the four year long uh, get together of, of uh, powerful men in Europe, um, they came to the, the German city of Constance uh, to discuss who should be the next pope, because they had three at the time, they had to figure out the right one, uh -huh. and uh, it took them several years to agree on, on their next political strategies, and they hired thousands of women to serve them sexually during that time. So that is, that's something the elites have always practiced, that's not new. So I always find it important to emphasize a tolerance for brothel keeping and for sex buying has been there for a long time, is a very integral part of a lot of European culture. And, um, but this, like, this is no contradiction with saying we despise the women, we think they're less than, they're at the outskirts of society, we'll punish them, we'll put all these rules on them. They can sell sex, but only in like these very limited restricted areas. Um, we won't have them at our dinner table, those sorts of attitudes. So, that's why like i i like to emphasize emphasize like as as a feminist i'm anti-industry but i'm pro-woman and a lot of people are pro-industry but anti-woman and our legislation tried to remedy that a bit and and say okay we actually do want to give women some rights that's what happened in 2002 and clarify their legal status so for example they'd be able to sue johns who didn't pay only this whole law, and that's just one example, is not written for how prostitution really works. It's written for some idealized situation where the woman is, you know, she is German, she knows her rights, um, she's got a lawyer and a tax manager and all these things. And yeah. it, I mean, in reality, John's pay up front. That's the absolute norm because it's so common that later on there'll be a battle over the payment because he wasn't satisfied with the service. So this isn't even a practical law change for her. Um, and so there were some some other changes too. Um, it's very complicated to trace because due to our history, well, our Nazi history actually, the German political system is very decentralized in its power. So it's a lot up to local states, local governments, local cities, how they wanna handle prostitution. Our federal law is used to be for a long time until um, a few years ago, very, very lax. So right. some places like Berlin decided, oh, you can have a brothel anywhere. We will put no rules on it. You can sell sex anywhere, while others are, well, not close to churches, not close to kindergartens, not in this area, not in that. So some cities very, very liberal and free and some very strict. Okay. Um, so this varies a lot. So I'm trying to say a lot of the same, uh, things at the same time. So first of all, this law tried to sort of come, uh, you know, be a little bit kinder to women. But in reality, there still are prohibitionist areas. You can still be arrested for selling sex. Um, and depending on, on what, depending on what city you're in or what state? Um, yeah, if you're in a no-go zone and a lot of Germany is still a no-go zone. Um, okay, can, so it's not mm -hmm. completely legal in all parts of Germany. No, Some and it parts. isn't, it is in no, in no country, not even New Zealand. So oh. New Zealand is often pointed to as being very different from Germany. They say Germany legalized and New Zealand decriminalized. Um, so the idea is in legalization, you've got all these industry specific rules, while decriminalization just removes any penal code, criminal code associated with prostitution and just um, lets it be run by regular um, criminal law or, or so 
anti-assault or violence law and regular labor law, which is complete nonsense. You always need prostitution specific law and New Zealand has 52 paragraphs of that. Um, but um, it's looking at different areas in Germany or comparing Germany and New Zealand, it's a question of how much does the state intervene and state intervention itself is also complicated because sometimes state intervention is good because we, for example, we want to identify when there's trafficking of adults or even minors into legal brothels, which very much does happen. So we want someone to go in and get those victims out, right? But at other times- oh, hold, on, hold on, so these yes. are legal brothels, but there's still trafficking involved? Yes. And underage minors being brought yes. in? Yes. Yes, and these these cases are uncovered all the time, and who knows how much go, flies under the radar. So I recently yeah. read a report it, by a German. Mm -hmm. Oh, isn't that kind of funny? Because it wasn't part of the thinking of we want to make it safe and making it legal is going to make it safe and all above board. And wasn't that the yeah. justification for legalizing it? And yet we still yes. have trafficking, which means organized crime. Yes. And, and trafficking of minors, which means oh, organized crime as well. Okay. Yeah, when it becomes legal, actually the perfect place to place a trafficking victim is inside the legal brothel. Right. Because I, I know this might be a little bit counterintuitive, but it actually is. I recently read a report by uh, someone who, who was a senior police investigator for 30 years, and he says, the, the legal brothel is the perfect place to, to place my sex trafficking adult uh, or, or minor victim because um, I can make it look like consensual prostitution and I am just her manager. So a lot of the activities of these criminal gangs, like setting a timetable for her, uh, putting ads online for her, driving her to the location, all, the, all these are things that pimps do. They're all legal. They're, yeah. they're all assumed to be ethical sex work managers until she can prove otherwise. And she has to meet a very, very high um, um, burden. There's a very, very strong burden of proof for her right. uh, to actually show that she was victimized. Um, so like, I know a lot of sex trafficking survivors and not a single one of their abusers uh, is behind bars. Um, and uh, oh, yeah, that's, so, is... that's so ironic that legalizing it actually facilitates illegal activity. Yeah, so the I, I think the idea was, this was a well-intentioned law, the idea was we'll make this legal business and we'll we'll get a fair number of women who, who want to do this, who are reasonably freely consenting, and then all the Johns will want to go see them and this will like push away the illegal market and the traffickers, but that's not how it works at all. There's a there's a lot of denial of realities going on there where in reality very very few women want to do this um you can see this also if you simply look at the demographic data of who is in the sex trade so in germany there's more women from romania than from germany who that have a awesome. license to sell so that's not the black market which also exists so um. that this is an incredibly impoverished population. And in New Zealand, same thing, Maori and Asian women vastly, vastly overrepresented. And yeah. they're all assumed to be consenting sex workers basically until they themselves go to the authorities because there is a very shameful history of police, um, medical personnel harassing women, doing invasive medical exams, um, arresting abuse, et cetera. A lot of people felt like the state should pull out and should stop harassing women and just wait for the women to come to you. But that assumes that she has that level of freedom to come to you when she's being abused, like she's not paid by the John or beaten by the pimp or whatever it is. She's got a drug problem, she'll just come to you. And in reality, this is an industry that is very closed off to the outside. A lot of women describe living in basically a parallel society. And again, a lot of these women don't even speak German or English, right? They'll speak Chinese or Romanian right. or Russian or- um, well, How much agency do you have? How much agency do you have when you're in a brothel all day and can't speak the local language to communicate anything to anybody? Like I'm being hurt, I'm being beaten, I'm being trafficked. Who do you tell? Who do you want to talk to? A lot of these women, I'm sure you've heard this from survivors, they don't know that they meet the legal criteria of sex trafficking. I found this, right. and the journalists don't know either, and some of the social workers yeah. don't. I recently saw this um, TV investigative journalism piece uh, report uh, where they interviewed a woman who said, this legal brothel is so good to me because I get to choose the Johns. So before she was at a brothel where she didn't get to choose the Johns, that is sex trafficking. 
that is that meets the legal state and she didn't know that so she's a, that was a german woman who knew the language um you know her family was here everything uh she she sort of has the best starting conditions for being an independent sex worker and she didn't know that she was experiencing sex trafficking um that she that there was crimes being committed against her and I understand a lot of people have trouble with this, like we don't want to stigmatize women, we don't want to call them stupid. I'm not saying women are stupid, I'm saying this system is so perfidious, it tricks you into accepting a lot of abuse and violence as normal, as a bad work day, and I think the sex work mentality helps with that, like they talk about sex worker burnout. Well, no, actually, those are PTSD symptoms, you know, there's there's a lot that goes on there, and the state tried to be kind and destigmatize women by speaking, you know, of labor rather than sin. But behind that labor and work title, there's a lot of criminal, awful people hiding a lot of awful activity. Yeah, well, I want to talk about the term sex worker at, later on, but let, let's go into a little bit of statistics. So give us an idea of these uh, brothels. Um, how big are they? How many women are there? How many men a day go? What kind of money are they bringing in? Let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so it is a big industry and it, it definitely grows. Like when you tell people you can open brothels and you raise a whole generation of boys to think that this is normal. This is something to do on an 18th birthday. You, wow. We have massive sex tourism into Germany. We're a sex tourism destination. So we have the German men going to Thailand and we have Thai women being trafficked here so that men can have this Thailand experience right outside their door. Um, yeah, it's a huge industry. Um, oh, I, I used to know this number, but it's a, it's a billion euro yearly industry. It's bigger than the German textile. Um, I have to check the exact numbers of how much revenue, but it's bigger than our textile industry. And everyone, everyone wears clothes and only like the latest um, research said that about 23, 24% of German men are admitted to paying for sex in their lifetime. An average around almost eight to quarter, nine times. Almost a quarter but, of German men yes. is paying for sex. Admitted. That's, that's, I admit to it, so it's probably higher. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, so it's, yeah, it's like I said, a huge aspect of the culture has been for a long time and is only propelled by this industry because it says you're just a customer. Like, it's not, it's, what's the difference from going to the barbershop and going to the brothel or the, or the massage studio? What's the difference? Um, uh, some more numbers. So we actually don't know for sure how many brothels there are or how many women are in them. People expect when you legalize, there'll be transparency. Just like the textile industry, I can like track how many dresses were made and like sold by H&M, let's say. Right. Um, but the record keeping on the sex trade is very difficult and very, very hard to track. So actually until 2017, uh, women did not have to register. Um, like no matter what business I, I open, if, if I open a hair salon, whatever, I have to register my business and not for the sex trade that they didn't have to. So there were no official numbers. No, nobody knew it. There were estimates ranging from 50,000 to 400,000. Really? And yes, yes. But these are all like, like, no. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. We're, we even can't the even... low end is astounding, though. 50,000 as a low yes. estimate is yes. unbelievable. Well, our population is 80, 80 million. So that's about 40 million men, um, yeah. plus the sex tourists. So, um, four, so 40 million men. Mm -hmm. and let, okay, let's say 20 some, million. Let's say half of them are like really young or really old. So let's say 20 yes. million. So if we take a quarter of them, it's 5 million men a year, but it's probably six or 7 million men a year paying for sex. And there's the sex tourists coming in as well. Um, yeah. so, actually, so, they come so, across the border from France a lot since the Nordic France. model. So okay. mm -hmm. okay. since France is the Nordic model, so they come into Germany because it's legal here. Like right. we go for weed, we go to Amsterdam for prostitution. The French come to Germany now, they do. So it seems that we can infer from that that if we make it legal and, and allow for men to have unlimited access to paid sex, the demand will grow exponentially to the point that it will be almost un physically unable to meet the demand for paid sex. Because if um, you yes. take 50,000 women compared to 5 million men, um, what's the math? Like, I don't know, like one woman would have yeah. 100 men a day or something like that. 
So, um, so in in, in, yeah. in brothels, it would be normal to, like in these regular brothels, where men stay for like half an hour. So it, people think they go on like they go to the opera, like in Pretty Woman, and then they have dinner, and then yeah, yeah, they'll have fun. they'll cuddle, oh, and then that's there'll fun. be some some passionate, mutually enjoyable sex. No, it's like half an hour, and he says off the menu. I want a blow job and then I want vaginal and maybe I'll pay extra for anal and then I want to come on your face like excuse my language but that's how it works and so that might happen to her somewhere between five six seven times a day like on average that could be more so there are women like uh, some Johnson said like I'm number 12 or 13 today and that's I mean Anyone who's had oh. sex, including people who've had positive experiences, he wouldn't want to do it 12, 13 times a day or even five, six. Like it's just physically, I think, too taxing. And so I can speak having, some about having, the... If you're having sex with, say, 12 men a day, uh, six days a week, it's 72 men a week, which is 288 men a month, which is 3,456 men a year. And I actually want to uh, say something before I forget. Um, so I, I want to say that the things I describe are not just in the streets or like these seedy brothels. Even the high class escorting is a very dangerous taxing business, if you want to call it. Very uh, recently, um, I should mention there's a survivor organization that people should look up. Some of their texts are in English as well. They're called Netzwerk Ella. I can send a link to that. A woman wrote this text recently. She said, I was a high class escort. And people often said, oh, I'm so jealous because you make 100 euros an hour. That's so much. Like, I make 20 an hour. Mm -hmm. So you, you, aren't you getting rich? And she said, no, all I ever got were deaths. Because as a high class escort, I sit there all day looking at the advertising website. I get these disgusting messages from men saying what they want to do to my body. Then I try to pick the least disgusting ones. And um, spend a lot of time preparing, you know, putting on the makeup, putting on the clothes, uh, being really anxious because even if he was kind of okay via the messages, when I turn up to the hotel, I got no idea who he is. If he's got a body in in the in like the bathroom, who's gonna come out and suddenly they'll want, you know, a group thing, and and um, I won't be able to defend myself if someone attacks me. And like escorting is still very dangerous and not, it's actually not lucrative at all because if you factor in all the hours she spent going through these horrible messages, uh, waiting, preparing, investing in the clothes, the condoms, whatever, um, she actually comes out a lot of the time, um, yeah, indebted during that day. So, yeah. Even so, yeah, and so when we talk about that, it, as, if, as if any amount of money is adequate compensation for the risk of rape, abuse, catching a disease, being Unwanted pregnancy. denigrated, right? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, something I wanted to mention because you asked for numbers. Uh, we do have a very detailed study from the family ministry that compares the non-prostituted population and nearly, I think, nearly 100 women in the sex trade. And their health outcomes are vastly worse than everyone else on like every scale, uh, including, um, well, this this health issues that I think people don't even think about just um, the, yeah, the risk of unwanted pregnancy, like a lot of women are, are uh, well, having to take a lot of contraceptives that have their own side effects. Uh, I mean, it's the only so-called job that could make you need an abortion. Uh, like that could cause the pregnancy that would meet you a woman to make that very personal decision do i keep it or not because i mean the father is not going to be involved uh, right that's a, that's i mean you might know this the whole issue in sex tourism like these men going abroad and and uh, like in, in the philippines or thailand or all over the world really uh fathering all these children that are half white that are going to be recognizable such their community but sorry bringing it back to germany um the health outcomes are vastly worse for women, and then it's no surprise that a lot of them use, you know, uh, uh, take too many painkillers, um, use all these um, drugs, alcohol, numbing agents, drugs, and alcohol. Even just chain smoking is very, very destructive to the body. So, right. like, and and these these are really unhealthy environments. The brothels or even the escorting, like you're, um, even though there's actually high time for the brothel is during lunch break when all the married men have automatic alibi for the wives at home, but still a lot of the women are awake during nights as well. And that's very bad for your body. We know night shifts. So add all these risks, all these health risks, plus unhealthy, a lot of time, unhealthy diets, um, very, very long shift lengths that you'd have to be available. 
um, the high stress of what's the next John going to be like? I don't know if he's he going to be safe because, and like, this is not me speculating. Like I just mentioned, there's, there are some studies on that, not as many as we'd like to be, but some research and um, what, what we, uh, what you can always look at is what kind of advice do the people who speak of sex work give to women and just read through their, their, workplace advice it's like how to not get raped how to not catch hiv how not to die tonight like what kind of occupational hazard is that especially considering that we're making women take all these risks for what purpose so men can get that half hour that i described like via quick orgasm like right. because people like to say oh but people die during construction and i'm like yeah we shouldn't well, first of all, we don't need football stadiums in Qatar, I think, personally. Um, but aside from that, we do need houses and we should make construction as safe as possible. But people need houses. We don't yeah. need this industry. And last I want to mention is there's been at this stage uh, since that law was passed in 2002, um, over 100 women murdered that we know of. There's actually wow. no official tracking of that because the, the German, I think it was the Bureau for Criminal Investigation said it would be stigmatizing to track this population's homicide rate, um, to single them out as uniquely vulnerable. And then like, it's, so so like a lot of this is like, oh, naming that this could be a dangerous industry is the problem rather than it being a dangerous industry. Yes. But um, right. so like homicide, like a lot of women say, wh whether I talk to women from Germany or New Zealand or Canada or South Africa or India, they're like, I'm not sure I'm going to be back home with my kids tonight. Like I'm, I'm worried. I'm worried. Like maybe it hasn't happened to me, but I have, I have this, this colleague, um, that's the word that some women would use. Um, and she, she was once horrifically beaten up, and I'm just so scared it's going to happen to me. Um, and even just living in that anxiety, uh, causes lifelong health problems. Like nearly every survivor I know, even if she's been out 10, 20, 30 years, lives with health problems, nearly everyone knows somebody who died, yes. overdose, violence, yes. illness, or, or trauma, um, suicide, overdose, yeah, and um, that's not the same case for office workers, or even construction workers, let's be real. Um, and so, then, yeah, so you're kind of talking about the whole, it's just another job, and sex work is work, and, and the argument against that is, you know, name me another job where the inherent hazards are rape, death, Name me a job where you're expected to exchange bodily fluids with somebody. Because like even in jobs like nurses and dentists, you know, they're, they're all gowned up and garbed up and latex gloved up and masked up and everything. You're not expected and, to exchange bodily fluids. And we need so. them. We need nurses. Yeah, right. I know it's an incredibly tough job and they're underpaid and there's so much reforming we need to, but these are all industries that needs reforming. The sex yeah. industry, uh, I think it needs abolishing, not reforming, first of all, but um, what was I going to say? It, it, um, I think it refuses to be reformed. I think Germany is a good example of why. We've had these, like I mentioned, this patchwork. In Berlin, the laws are like that. In Munich, their laws are like that. In Hamburg, they're doing a, like we've had seen, we've seen many different levels of regulation on the sex trade, more hands-off, more hands-on, and yeah. they all it does, doesn't change the population exploited. It doesn't do much about the levels of violence, the right. levels of illness. Um, it remains a harmful industry. And I think that's because we refuse to look at the demand and what does it really want? These men do not want to meet a woman on eye level and right. be like, well, you know, I'll give you the money. And if you want to stay with me for the next hour, then stay. But if you want to go, that's fine. Just go. Like that doesn't happen. The moment he pays, he insists like what I told you I want, we'll do that now. And don't yeah. you dare change your mind. And there will be consequences. He'll give her a bad review. He might verbally or physically abuse her. He might call the call the madam yeah. uh, or the pimp. Um, and just that that very dangerous sexual entitlement that that breeds. Like I paid, therefore I am owed. That is the core mentality of the sex trade. You can't reform that out of there. Otherwise, men yeah. would just go date, but they don't yeah. want to. They want to buy it. Well, it's it's about control and power the end of the day and i remember and when i interviewed andrea heinz who you also interviewed she talked about work she worked in a brothel and uh the guy would come in and she would say right up front you're wearing a condom and he would go okay i'm wearing a condom and then they would start engaging in sex act and then he'd just pull the condom off yeah or, or try to pull it off and then she'd stop him and he'd put another condom on and then he tried again 
And yes. I, what's she going to do? There's nothing she can do. And complaining to the madam will do nothing. Right? And then what if he starts to hit her? Or gets violent, right? And so people need to remember that in all women in prostitution are inherently vulnerable to men by virtue of their smaller social, a, a smaller physical status and, and weaker strength. There's some exceptions, but generally men biologically have much greater upper body strength than an average woman, and they're all yes. inherently vulnerable to that. Yes. That's just a and fact. And I mean, I thought we understood broadly, like at least during Me Too, that it's very, very hard to speak up against your abuser, even as a woman outside the sex trade, be it your boyfriend, your boss, whoever. It's very, very hard. We know most rapists, or like 1% of rapists get successfully prosecuted, a ridiculously small amount. But the sex trade will be the one place where lots and lots of women reporting will lead to a fundamental change in men's behavior. No, like it's very, very hard for a woman like me who's you know I, i'm in the country where i speak the language i know my rights um i have a good friend who studies law who can advise me if, if i'm not sure if something's a crime or not it's harassment or not and i still struggle when when something happens to me um like and how is it going to be like for the romanian migrant a lot some of these women haven't finished high school some of them are illiterate you have to write your laws for the most vulnerable not right. women like me Right. And even I wouldn't be protected by these laws. And, and let's be clear, rape happens in brothels. And it's obscured by the fact that money's exchanged. So there's a little trick that happens where people think, oh, well, because he's paying her, it's consensual. Right? But it's a lot more nuanced than that. So like the example I gave of trying to pull the condom up, or let's say um, the, the man says, I want oral. And then halfway through, turns her around and starts to uh, have anal sex with her. And she protests because I didn't agree to anal sex. And he's a very large man, 350 pounds, and he's extremely strong. And he holds her down and forces her to have anal sex. And this absolutely happens. He raped her. Right? Yeah, and again, I always ask people, remove the money, because money clouds your your understanding of what's going on. If this was a woman in a relationship, and her husband is working, and she doesn't work, so she's living off his earnings, yeah. um, can she just get up and leave? Like, if he did any of those crimes to her, can she just get up and leave? No, she needs that money. She needs, she, she needs to... Well, she, they probably share a house. Like hmm. we understand how difficult it is for women to leave in that situation. And I'd say prostitution shares so many commonalities with domestic violence. And we understand domestic hmm. violence doesn't always use physical violence. It also uses financial and emotional. So even sure. if that John uh, st stuck to, he's, he said, I want oral, they just do oral. If she is doing that because otherwise she'll be kicked out of her apartment, uh, she won't get the next drug she needs or her kid is going to go to school hungry. I think that's violence too. A lot of women have said that um, poverty was my pimp or addiction or trauma was my pimp. So I think that's important to understand. Even if every John uh, completely agreed to the script that was agreed upon before, the conditions of consent at the outset for her are so restricted. If she says no, like she might go hungry or her kid might go hungry. Um, she the, the, They'll turn off her water, her electricity. Um, they'll send her back to her village in Romania where they don't even have water and electricity. Wow. So, like, I think that's that's very important. That's why I'm not an anti-trafficking activist. I'm an anti-prostitution activist because I think the parameters for meaningful consent where two people desire each other, it's not one person trying to survive or trying to work through a trauma or trying to get a drug, whatever it is. They're almost never met in sex trade. I won't even say 100%. It doesn't matter. But as a right, system... Oh. It yeah. violates it so frequently that it's, I think it's indefensible and unreformable. Well, and, and here's the thing I never hear anyone say is uh, how healthy is this? So how healthy is it for a woman to basically spend a 12 hour shift in a room having sex with uh, 240 men a month um, and, and to engage in sex acts regardless of how she feels that day, if she has a headache, if she's a bit off, if she finds the partner personally repugnant to them because he's 400 pounds and stinks and is gross, is totally unattractive. And this is okay. Why? Because he pays her. That, that's yeah. it. It's okay because he pays her. That's okay. And, and, and yeah. is it healthy? And so 
is this is this good healthy sex because because people never think about sex as, as being healthy or unhealthy or having good motives or not like if this is so great why does he have to pay her oh mm -hmm. right she's only doing it for the money which means what right yeah, i well i hear this myth not consensual only... is it right the if it's way... consensual why do you have to give money sorry go ahead I... This happens with the delay. People just interrupt each other. I'm sorry. Yeah, you know, um, I was going to say, it's because um, I think the only way that people can justify it is by really strongly believing this myth that most of these women are nymphomaniacs, which I think is just, oh, I mean, I know, like yes, oh. yes. I hear this all the time. And I think you, uh, you as a, as a therapist will know, like sex addiction harms people. Even if these were sex addicted women, that would be dangerous behavior. It still harms your body. Your body's not made for 12 men a day. No way. Um, and, but I mean, even if these were sex addicts, it would still be dangerous and they'd need help. Um, but what you're saying, you're saying poor women from Eastern Europe have disproportionate rates of sex addiction. Like what's going on? Like, isn't this like a racist myth that the, yeah. they're like inherently submissive and they just like doing what men want. That's a fantasy that some John subscribe, but anyone who thinks about it for a few seconds knows that's nonsense. Yeah. Um, that like... That, that's not why the sex trade exists. It's not because women, there, there are some women who are born this way, but that's also a very, very old idea. Actually, um, what was it? The the uh, the people who did the, the crane, was it craniologists? The, um, the people who were measuring people's skulls to decide oh, their- Oh, yeah, yeah. Back know, in the, like, like the 1800s or 1700s, right? If yeah. If bigger it, skull, you were smarter or something like yeah. that. They did these studies on women in prostitution and said, I think based on their skulls or whatever, they have a higher sex drive and that's why they're doing this. And this, and then there comes the modern iteration that says, well, some women find this liberating and they have like six orgasms a day and it's the best job ever. And I'm like, this is... I'd be, I'd be surprised if any of them have any orgasms. <laughs> and it's... Right? it's yeah. Um, yeah. I'm just like... I wish we'd study our history a little bit more because this is very old thinking draped in modern, I, I might call it woke language, but it's the same old idea. Some women are born this way and they are indestructible really. And I, I do understand that there has been a lot of rhetoric, there still is today, that's very, very disrespectful towards women. So it's like, they're, they're all a bunch of diseased, broken um, gutter people and uh, they're below us and right and not at our dinner table and a lot of people feel like if i instead say they're powerful women they're they're angels and healers and protectors this will raise their social status but really you're hiding all the harm and i i actually i recently wrote an article about how women because of this like healer myth that, that prostitution is very healing to men um there are programs in germany where they take women from brothels and they send them into prisons and psychiatric clinics to be sex on hand sex therapist for for men who are convicted of rape this I, I know this yes what? yes you yes explain that again there there are documented cases where um therapists of convicted uh, sex criminals in prisons and in in uh, these therapy clinics they get women in prostitution to come to the clinic or the the or for men to get day parole from prisons and go out and practice hands-on on a woman in prostitution how to you know learn consent and how to be respectful towards women oh i see okay so if there's people, kind of know a that, logic behind that but it's it's pretty twisted at the same time isn't it and this is supported by a lot of pro prostitution organizations so like we are just like nurses we are healers and that sounds better than saying you're this sinful gutter woman but I'd say there's a third no, way. No, the, the convicted rapist is just going to be like, wow, I get to have sex with this person. I'll play nice. I, I can play yes. nice for the therapist. Yeah. I'll, sure. Oh, I'll, I'll pretend to get consent. Oh, do you like this? Do you want to do that? I can play. These guys are pretty smart. Some of them, they can play along. And I mean, yeah. I just can't believe that they actually think that this is going to help them. That's That's unreal. The brothel is the last place going to play learn along with consent. it and then go, oh, I'm cured. I've learned consent. Now let me back out so I can go back to raping. 
Yeah, yeah, no, it's insane. And if people find this hard to believe, I have like a bunch of sources. I can share the article so people can read what this is like and how it's being defended. Yeah. And why, like I said, this is a very old idea draped in modern language. And supposedly this is gonna empower women, but I think really it just degrades them to sex machines in a, in a new way with a slightly nicer language. But they're still yeah. not human beings who are three dimensional, who have physical and mental limits. That's not stigmatizing. We all do, we all have limits. We all have boundaries and we all have complex histories and traumas to work through. But in the sex trade, all that thing that we learned about complex, you know, psychology, physiology goes out the window when women are viewed as these mythical, happy, happy nymphos by a lot of people, a frightening number. Yeah, I, I think what's way more common than the, the happy hooker myth or the, the nympho myth though, is really that they're basically seen as objects and not as people at all and that's essentially what's happening in a brothel and this goes back to my question about how is this good relational healthy connected sex because the men in brothels don't see those women as people they i i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna say almost all of them that pay for prostitution have spent many thousands of hours consuming pornography yes that has trained their brains to see women as objects okay and um, th th this is literally true. They've done studies. I don't know, you may have heard of this, but um, they showed images of um, a bag of tools and women in bikinis. And yeah. the same part of the brain lights up. The same part of the brain lights up in the man looking at this. And this is really interesting. A fully clothed, like just a, you know, jeans and a sweater, a uh, picture of a woman does not activate this part of the brain. So yeah. when men see women in porn literally as objects. So what do we do with objects? We use them. We love people, but we use objects. So yeah. we said, okay, let's make it as easy as we can for as many men as possible to use as many women as possible without repercussion. And this is what we have. In the legal brothel system essentially yeah. that, that's kind of how i see when i boil it right down that's it and if people need an illustration for that i'm not sure when we were going to talk about it i'll just interject it here yeah, go ahead. How, the, the way the prostitution advertising looks tells you everything like if you don't want to Let's listen go to into me that. and and, yeah. and give me some people quotes feel on like, that mm -hmm. yeah if people feel like oh well that's just the feminist ranting at me just go on any prostitution advertising site and just look at even just with the images and the names, they're so dehumanizing. I myself, because give, give me some I, language. What's the language? Do you have something there to quote? Yes, yes. No, I, I will. Um, I just want to say I, I try oh, to okay. avoid looking at pornographic images as much as I can because I find they stick in your brain more than even the words do. Um, so I didn't look at this myself for a long time because I, I, I got a feeling it could be quite bad. It was even worse than I expected. The images. The, the how women so the first interaction if i'm a john i go on the internet i put in my city and i check out what brothels and escort agencies there are and um, i look at the profiles of women and the, the first that they'll greet me is her photo a lot of times there's no face no that's also for anonymity reasons granted but instead the first introduction is a body part that could be her breasts yeah. uh, stomach um buttocks um or her genitalia so very, very explicit pornographic images and a sea of headless bodies. As I scroll through, I just see body parts. Like people feel like if I say prostitution is the sale of bodies, like, oh, my, come on, you're exaggerating. If you see these websites, they advertise, that's what it looks like, a, a flesh market. That's what it looks like. It, it's I, I like as a feminist, or you don't have to be a feminist, just an empathetic person. I always remind myself that's not breasts that's a person that's a woman right. that's a three-dimensional being person. but that's not what the john is going to think oh i wonder what her hobbies are her favorite music her daughter's name um it's just like do i think i like those breasts are they big enough and so like men can like um put these parameters i want breasts of this size mm. i want weight or height of this this number i want this race mm. this is like where you can choose your service provider by their race yeah. Like what's going on with that? It's incredibly racist. Like the um, black women will have to play up, you know, being exotic or wild and Asian women will put in schoolgirl outfits and with teddy bears. Mm -hmm. um, very young women will also put schoolgirl outfits to emphasize that they're barely legal. Um, and then the names 
Um, I mean, first of all, of course, you know, all women use fake names. Um, so he'll never, he hopefully never know her real name. Um, well, we obviously you got these stripper stripper names, um, but a lot of the time these advertising names, they have these really degrading porn language in them. So she wouldn't just be called like, let's say Angelique, but like, well, hot and sexy would be the more tame version. She her name her her name that he first encounters her with online could be like as fuck Angelique or um big tits Angelique or um MILF obviously um oh, sorry these this like really gross words some of these I barely want to say uh, like you mentioned I I, oh. I made a I made a oh, post yeah. on um, I made a post on, on on social media. I can link that as well, so people can take a look. Or like women whose name she doesn't even have a name. Her name is Cump Slut. That's yeah. dehumanizing. That's yeah. completely dehumanizing. Oh, so, it's a common word in in porn. Cum dumpster. Cum slut. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you see that in, the, in titles of porn videos all the time. Yeah. So like that's how you can see how degraded. how porn and prostitution completely overlap, and how how the average John is not interested. Like it could be. An actual, I mean, if, if if this was like a very high quality dating side, that'd be like lots of photos of her like doing her hobbies. I don't know, she's just painting and horse riding or, and mm. instead there's this super dehumanized uh, photo or several that are often very explicit. They're already porn. That's already porn. That's yeah. on the internet forever. Yeah. Um, that very dehumanizing fake name. And then her profile will say, I just love big cocks, blah, blah, blah. And this like fake nymphal persona. Right. I just I am a hobby whore. That's a normal term on the German sites. I'm I'm not a I'm not a prostitute. I'm a hobby whore. I just do this for fun because he still wants the illusion that she really she doesn't have oh, a life. She okay. just she works a normal some... job during the day, and then for her own satisfaction, her own hobby, mm. she goes and works in a brothel at night and loves big cock. Can't get and that's a total lie. You've got no idea what that woman's real story is. Again, her pimp could oh. be poverty, homelessness, drugs, abusive boyfriend, trafficker. That so, and these ads will all look the same. They will all look the same. You've yeah. got no idea what her real story is. And uh, one more thing I wanted to mention, I found going on these sites really upsetting and. Uh, because a lot of these women look unwell. These are not glamour shots. This is not glamour porn like that mm -hmm. that you imagine with like good lighting and like very expensive looking outfits. A lot of these women, the, it looks very cheap, like it's done on a cell phone. You can see um, like um, some women, like their skin doesn't look healthy. Like I'm, I'm, it looks like I could send this to my doctor and ask him like, this person's ill, can you help them? Right. Um, and it's like, and I, I was like, so not only does he want a sex object, he wants it her to look cheap. And like he wants her to look like she's from the gutter. Right. Um that's that was like a new realization for me. I thought like um men want like this like very elaborate fantasy. And like I'm sure that exists maybe in the sugar babying world where they want something that, that looks very fashionable and expensive, but this looks like very, very cheap homemade porn. And uh, it it just, I think it heightens the dehumanization even more because I mean, we look at supermodel photos sometimes and we think, yeah, that's kind of a dehumanizing photo. Like she looks like a doll, but uh -huh. we, women don't just look like dolls. They look like broken dolls. I, I don't know if I'm explaining that well. For people who can stomach it, you can check it out yourself. I, I will make a YouTube video about this, but I'll, of course I'll be blurring the images because uh -huh. I don't want to share porn around. Um, but yeah, it's very, once you've seen that, I don't know how anyone can defend the sex industry. It's it's so misogynistic, racist, and dehumanizing. Even if there's like one or two women on that side who who do do this out of fun, I, I well, doubt it, but it's possible. Yeah. The, that system's still so screwed up, I can't possibly support it. And 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 back to the, the sex work is work, you know, like who, who out there applying for a job as a, um as a, a bookkeeper an accountant or a customer service representative puts on their resume i'm a hot triple t that loves hot cock that loves big cock on their resume applying for a job in customer service or accounting yeah nobody right yeah so you know to say this is a job like any other is a gross misrepresentation of the facts and and no one in Germany, when they try to leave the sex trade, which is still very hard for women, and there's a lack of investment in exit programs, because why would you? It's just the job. 
Um, no woman says to the sales rep or McDonald's or the university, wherever she's applying, I spent this many years at the brothel. Because nobody recognizes any expertise from that. And I wouldn't even say that women have none. They got a lot of survival skills. Yeah. And like, sure, it, it help, does help if you are charismatic uh, or very intelligent and you're a quick judger of people's character. I'm sure it helps, yeah. but um, nobody recognizes those skills. And I don't think that'll ever happen because if if as a society, we like really recognized women's humanity, like we couldn't continue this industry. So like this, 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 I think it's a fever dream to think this will ever actually honestly be treated as a job like any other Um because student as you you see women's humanity, you're like, well, we have to shut this down. Yes. Now, Ellie, I know you've spent um, a lot of time uh, going on what are called John forums. So for people that aren't familiar with that, uh, there are Johns that have set up forums online where they all can go. These are people that pay for sex regularly and they can rate and give commentary on their experiences with different women in these brothels. Um, and so I wanted I wanted to do a screen share of one of the, I hope this works, of um, a page that you came up with. So, so this is you compiling this, right? Yes. So when I said earlier about how um, you have to see a woman as an object to pay to have sex with her and, and how dehumanizing this all is, let's, don't take my word for it, let's look at the actual words of the sex buyers themselves so these are um, actual uh, quotes from reviews that sex buyers have gone so here, yep. here's one um, uh, i always book chemo for 30 minutes and spray my cum twice can hardly believe she's supposed to be 26 or 27 she looks at least five years younger and her body is like that of a 16 year old complete objectification she's talking about her body she isn't the active type. She's more submissive. She holds out her ass and lets you bang her silly quick break, a bit of chatting and repeat. German mm -hmm. sex buyer from the Lustos Forum apartment brothel. So you were mentioned about apartment brothel. This is a legal brothel. I legal can brothel. find this, this brothel on Google Maps. Yeah. Uh, cute gal with cute little pointed titties started with fellatio and mean oral on her, put a condom on and then put it into her hole. So it's, it's yeah. not a lovely term to use on, on someone's body part, a hole. Yeah. She was yeah. built tiny with a teen body, but didn't complain once. Didn't take long, and I jacked off in missionary till I came. Looks so here. So we actually have a rating: A plus, titty small, service A minus, no French kissing, hygiene A, very fresh. Would do her again any time. Um, yeah. And they're, I mean, they just go on and on and on. Here's one. Because she was so uninterested and I wanted to get things done. So so she was so uninterested as if as if this is a, a perplexing, right? Because he might be the twelfth guy of the day. And and this is, you know, seems shocking to him that she's not totally into him. And who knows even what this guy looks like. I wanted to get things done. It was all over fast, but apparently not fast enough for her. I fucked her till I came and then I kept going until her lack of enthusiasm had almost turned into disgust. So, I mean, no, like what he's seeing is that she is feeling disgust for him because he's probably yeah. a gross, hairy, stinky pig. And while she got a few bruises, maybe the last punter wasn't all that nice to her. Yeah. So, I mean, what, so we're inferring from this that she's being physically abused to the point yeah. that it's visible for at least days and that um and and that she's being um she's being hurt right and i was i wanted to add that um understanding the law um people like people like to uh, say like prostitution sex trafficking totally separate i already explained that the sex trafficking into illegal brothels but it's another th thing when it comes to the johns that's very important to understand if you legalize sex buying that's sex buying of anyone over 18 unless you forgot to specify over 18 like switzerland did and then it's 16 actually um so child like commercialized child abuse was just legal in switzerland until 2013 for 16 17 year olds i'm i'm dead serious but anyway um so until 2017 in germany that it was not a crime to pay to in my opinion rape or use the services as some people call it um of, of a sex traffic person 
because he's just a customer and how could he have known? Well, first of all, we can see they do know and they do see a lot. Um, they don't always know if she's trafficked, but they do often and they don't care because it's just a service. Like if I go to the supermarket, there's not really trafficking in supermarkets, but there isn't a nail salon. So that's the comparison I often use. So if, if a woman goes into a nail salon and the Thai woman in the nail salon is trafficked, she as a customer isn't liable because how could she have known just getting her nails done? And we pretend like a man going to a massage brothel, um, massage parlor brothel, uh, getting a sexual act from, from a woman from Thailand, just to use that comparison, that's the same thing as getting your nails done. And you just, oh, you just can't tell, you're just a customer. Um, and so in a lot of countries, it, it just becomes legal for the John to participate in sex trafficking. And that was the case in Germany until 2017, but we still struggle to actually uh, get these men in front of a court. So if people are like, how are they admitting this? A lot of these websites are not in the dark net. Like you can Google these. Um, yeah, well, you, I mean, you got them without uh, much difficulty, right? And, and some of these are from Google Map, Maps reviews. You can review restaurants or brothels in Google Maps um, in Germany. Yeah, I wanted to read one yeah. more because mm -hmm. back to my point about they see these women as objects. Is a whore just a piece of fuck meat or does one have to show respect? So that, that would be a term for porn as well. Fuck meat would be mm -hmm. a porn term. I've been wondering if my approach is the rule. To me, a whore is just a thing. Well, like, I mean, he comes right out and says it. Yeah. Right? So, so let, let's listen to their own words to see what they think and how they see this. She's a thing there to satisfy me. So there's that gross entitlement as well. And I see this in, in a client sometimes too. It's, mm. it's the entitlement is so massive and yet they're blind to it. They, the men themselves don't see the gross entitlement to have their sexual needs met on demand and, yeah. and, but it's 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 a very strong motivating factor. I've noticed, especially hobby whores. Oh, there's that term you just used. Have been getting more bitchy and annoying while asking for more and more cash. How dare she have an opinion or speak up? How dare she? Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, she yeah. is just a piece of fuck meat and a whore after all. Have any of you noticed the same? Wow, this this poor poor guy. Eh? He's had such a rough go of it. She's actually, um, you know getting bitchy and annoying anyway yeah, they're stuff. the it's victims sort of, it's it's gross just um reading those really is your can you see your your page yes. here yes yeah, yeah so, that's my youtube channel yeah so this is ellie's awesome youtube channel and um uh you know just scroll through you can see some of these um uh talks that she's done the brothels cure male loneliness uh navigating stigma the TLDR. What's TLDR? Too long, didn't read. So a, a, a quick summary. Oh, okay. Why women sell sex? Um, sex workers and forums and sex buy forums. So we didn't go into sex worker forums. That'd be maybe an interesting conversation for another time. But we looked at some of the sex buyer forums. Uh, feminist porn on the rise and so on. So I really encourage everyone to check out um, Ellie's channel. You just go to YouTube and type in Ellie Arrow and you're on Twitter at Ellie Arrow, correct? Yes. And uh, there's some really, Ellie's done some really, really good work, Ellie, like just the time and effort that you put into really analyzing this. I'm going to stop sharing here. There we go. Okay. Um, so let, okay, let's talk about really quickly, um, um, well, just, let's just talk really quickly about what you have learned about why these women are working in brothels. And I'm sure there's a lot of answers to that question, but, you know, can mm -hmm. you sort of summarize the main things that you've come across or that you've noticed? Um, so, well, for for Germany, but there'll be a lot of parallels to other European countries and even globally. Like I, I often say, if you read the survivor's testimony, um, it, you could exchange the city. You could change Berlin for Toronto or mm -hmm. Sydney or Tokyo mm -hmm. or Cape Town. And other than a few, you know, cultural specifics, they'll sound the same. Okay. Um, bo both the entry path that is that is often um yeah yeah very very similar so even for the women who come from abroad so even the sex traffic women or the i would say 
economic refugees who are, like I mentioned, there are there are still places in Europe where people don't finish school um, or, or even finish like basic elementary school. That that still exists. People don't realize how poor some parts of Europe are. Okay. Um, or, or you don't have electricity. Like one of the biggest uh, populations in, in European prostitution are Roma women. So that's what pejoratively people call gypsies. So that's, I mean, oh, that's I a see. derogative term. So um, from, these traveler from communities. Germany? From Germany though? No, they are um well no, they're from Eastern Europe, but they they um they, the men from these communities are often exploited in like agriculture or in, in meat factories and in um okay. what do you call them? Where, where they, they butcher animals, that's traumatizing work as well. And the uh, the women are exploited in brothels and oh. girls too, and some young men also. Um so these are some of the most vulnerable communities, but on top of the extreme poverty, that is really worse than I think some people can imagine. I think, well, now with the, with the well, also war refugees from Ukraine, that's happening also. Right. Right. Um, and if it's just labor, do you really need to prevent it? Mm. So that's that's a whole issue in of itself. I have a YouTube so video on that as well. Poverty, poverty, displacement, economic necessity, being and, and, exposed through your life situation or economic situation being more vulnerable to maybe people always, easy money or however it's sold to them hey yes come over for some quick easy money right some of them are trafficked by their own families so sometimes this is a family oh, i mean a lot of these families love their daughters and their sons and want to protect them but sometimes it's not that rare that um, some of these are, are are criminal families who who are very patriarchal ones that say, well, we'll sacrifice some of our daughters so that we can live better. And that's very, very painful. And it's very hard for victims to get out of that, that they'll say, I, I choose to feed my family back home. But really, if you don't send money back home, you'll be disowned, you'll be kicked out. Um, it's it's right. so, so social factors and cultural factors play into it. Yeah. Yeah. Not just economic factors, there's social, cultural, yes, and theoretical systems coming into play. Yeah. Um, and yeah. it is not a myth that it's unbelievably common, even so that's not even a huge difference between the women who are mainly pushed by poverty or mainly pushed by third parties um that there's some sort of sexual trauma that precedes entry into the sex trade. So I mean, first of all, um, my understanding is about a third of people in the German sex trade entered under age. So they were sex traffic minors by definition uh, before they age, turned 18. Is that 18 or 16, Ellie? What's under age? Um, um, okay. Well, the age of consent in Germany is actually 14, but thank God that's not the one for prostitution. It was 16 until 2008, which I think is very recent. But since then, it's been 18, the minimum right. age for prostitution. Right. Um, but yeah, the, so we, we banned child sexual exploitation only in 2008. I think that's very, very shameful. Oh, you guys are so progressive. <laughs> and like I said, in Switzerland, that was 2013. So there are victims alive who were legally sold in brothels at 16, 17. Right. Yeah. And these are still like young, these are still young people, basically. Um, they're like in their 30s now. These are the victims whom that happened to. It's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. um, okay. You, you come across also uh, women who uh, maybe they're from Germany and, uh, you know, sort of middle class working women that really honestly think, hey, what if I put in a couple shifts a week, I can make an extra thousand euro a month and then they get into it. And for whatever reason, it, it sort of breaks them down or sucks them in or they're, you know, they yeah. end up getting sort of sucked into it. Do you, is that a, a common yes. story? I, I can't say how common exactly. We don't have exact breakdowns on the numbers there, but um, I would add that we're now in a place with the culture that it is possible that you have someone who is not incredibly poor, like not, I have no water and electricity poor, no. um, and that doesn't have a history of abuse, um, but lives in a culture where even among university students, it's sold to you as a quick way to do money. So there's a lot of predation on university. Well, first of all, there are poor university students. We should be clear sure. on that. Like just John's love is like, oh, she's a university student. She must be privileged. That's not necessarily true. But let's say, uh, and we like to judge, yeah, especially young women who want to afford like to do a round trip 
around Europe, for example, we, we oh. love to judge them as like material or whatever, materialist. Yeah. And, and I'm like, but we don't judge the men who, who exploit their naivete. I, that makes me, it makes me so angry. Um, so most of the women I know who were predated on as university students, they, they did have some kind of stress, like making rent, but occasionally it can be that she thinks, oh, my life will just be a little more comfortable, a little easier. But then she enters the industry. And like I mentioned, it's so easy to get into debt. There's so many loan sharks, so many pimps circling this, um, all these yeah. fictitious fees that the brothel owners will put on you. You're late. You're not wearing your clothes right. You're not doing this right. Pay me for this. Pay me for that. Oh, you owe me because of the laundry or whatever. Yeah. Um, sometimes completely made up debts that are created. Then you meet these shady criminal people that you didn't expect to meet. Oh, you, you meet that one John that completely traumatizes you. So I know women who were in the sex trade very briefly. So just half a year, a couple of months. And that was enough. And they're like, I'm going to be dealing with that for the rest of my life. And I like to bring it back to comparing it to an abusive relationship. I do know women who get into abusive relationships who were not, you know, traumatized in their families um, or whatever. That is common, but it's not always the case. Anyone can fall for, the, for an abuser in a relationship. And the sex trade works a very similar way. We got these, when it comes to, um, we know romantic abusers love like to do this love bombing. That's also a very common tactic among pimps. We call them lover boys. Yeah. Just yeah, shadow with problems. gifts, yeah. shower, shower in gifts and, and compliments. And that's what happens to a lot of women at the beginning of the sex trade. People tell you're so hot, you're so cool, you're yeah. so empowered. Um, and that can be the society grooming rather than just an individual man and victims don't see it. And if we can find the compassion for the women who are abused by boyfriends to do this, we should also find it for the ones where it's pimps or even society doing that grooming. So yes, that can happen. That is a factor now. It's such a culturally powerful force, this pro-prostitution propaganda that it alone can be a major factor pulling a woman in. And that's why I think the society is, is, shares huge responsibility and needs to course correct uh desperately agreed all right ali uh, i think we'll wrap up there because we're, we're over an hour and uh some great discussion i have a lot more things i'd, I'd love to talk about maybe we'll we'll do a part two next year sometime um but thank you so much for your your interest in this and your your research and the time you've invested in exposing the truth pulling back the curtain to expose the truth about the realities for women in these legal brothels and how we need to address this as a society and find better solutions than um, you know, hey, let's let's just decriminalize everything and give men all the paid sex they want because that's just a bottomless pit and creates a lot more problems than it solves. So, I think we need to you know do we need to do much better as a society and it starts with. You know, having these conversations and addressing these issues. So, so, so thanks again so much uh, for that. And um, let's stay in touch. And uh, you also have a great Christmas. We're coming up in nine days. So, hope you have a good holiday over there. And good Christmas. And we'll, uh, we'll talk maybe, uh, maybe next year we'll do a part two. Sound good? Yes, sure. Um, have, a, have a good Christmas as well and restful holidays. Thanks, Ali. Bye for now. Bye.